Hey, what's up? It's Jake from Nimbus DevOps, and we're going to go ahead and get started with Hashlib. So this is a Python module that provides access to a variety of cryptographic hash algorithms. They are mathematical functions that take a message of any size and produce a fixed result, which is referred to as a hash or a digest, as you'll see in here. Um, hashes have many uses, like verifying data integrity, uh, storing passwords, etc. But ideally, they have three uh, properties, and that's that they are deterministic in that the same message should always produce the same hash. They're irreversible in that it's not feasible to determine the original message from the hash, and that they're collision resistant, which means that it should be hard to find two different messages that produce the same hash. So those properties are crucial for secure applications of hash, and it could be considered imperative that passwords, for example, are only stored in hashed form. Um, the irreversibility property ensures even if data breach occurred that attacker couldn't get a hold of your password, um, or it would be very difficult for them to obtain the password. Um, having them stored only as hashes means that the only way to verify a password for a user when they log in is to compute the hash of the password they provided and compare it against some stored hash. Um, if you need more information on hashes, I'm not going to go into the cryptography. So like I said before, check out Computer File on YouTube and they do a great, uh, a great example of that. The AES-256 is definitely a good uh, one to go check out on their site. Um, so it, the password thing's not going to work if the hash algorithm is not deterministic. And then the collision resistance, the third part, it's important when hashes are used for data integrity verification. So if you're using a hash to check that a piece of data was not tampered with, an attacker who could find a hash collision could modify the data without changing the hash and then trick you into thinking that the data wasn't actually changed. Um, the exact set of algorithms are actually available through the Hashlib uh, library. They vary depending on what underlying libraries you have on your platform. Um, some are guaranteed, and you can actually see that. So let's go take a look. So if I go, uh, let's import Hashlib, import Hashlib, and then I'll, uh, uh, let me get it the Python first. There we go. Import Hashlib. And if I did Hashlib.algorithms underscore available, I can see the available algorithms or hash algorithms that you can use and there's also a, a guaranteed set of algorithms and you can just open your own python shell and type this in and see for yourself so if your application has to talk to like a third party app it's always best to pick an algorithm out of the guaranteed set because um, it means that every platform would support it so a lot of them start with SHA, which you'll notice and you'll hear that a lot and you'll hear me say it a lot. And that stands for Secure Hash Algorithm. That's what SHA is. So in the same shell, uh, let's create a hash for the byte string um, hash me now. Okay, so if I said h equals hash lib dot and then I'll use uh, Blake 2b. Okay, so I set that variable. And then I just say h dot update, and then let's add a byte string. Um, sorry, byte string of hash me. Sorry, hash me, like that. And then I could also update it with now, like that. And then if I uh, produce the hex digest. You can see what that value would be. That's your hash, and I could also do just hex or um, not hex. I could just do h dot digest, and you can see what that is. Um, I could see the block size, so block underscore size, and see how big it is. I can look at the digest size, so digest underscore size, and I can even look at the name. What what hash are we using? So in here, I use the Blake 2B cryptographic function, which is quite sophisticated. And after creating the hash object H, I updated the message in two different steps. Um, you, sometimes you'll need to hash data that's not 
always available all at once. So it's good to know that you can do this in two steps if you need to. Um, and then once I have the entire message, you can get the hexadecimal representation of the digest. Um, and that'll use two characters per byte as each character represents four bits, which is half a byte. And also the byte representation of the digest. And we, if you look at it, it has a block size of 128, a digest size of 64, and that's in bytes and a name. So what happens if instead of Blake 2, I used SHA-256? So let's say hash lib dot SHA-256 and then a byte string for hash me now dot hex uh, digest. Oops, what did I do wrong? Uh, I need to close this. There we go. So look at that. So that hash is shorter. And if you have a shorter hash, it's considered less secure. And you can construct the hash object with the message and compute the digest all in one line like I did there. Um, so hashing is an interesting topic. The These simple examples are just that. They're extremely simple. The Blake2B function allows you a lot of flexibility because there's a number of parameters that can be adjusted which means that it can be adapted for different apps or adjusted to protect against very particular parts um, or types of attacks. So we'll just briefly go over one um, of the parameters. The official documentation you can look up in the docs.python.org. There's a library just for hashlib and you can check that out. But there is a person parameter. So since we already imported hashlib, I can create this and it will pick it up hashlib.blake2b and let's give a byte string and we'll just say we have some important data here and then I will give it a digest size of 16 and I can use this person parameter equals and then a byte string for um, part one for example okay and then I'm gonna make a hash2 h2 actually I should do it this way and I can use this and have some important data and I can have this be part two and I can make a third one and have this be part three or just not have a part at all here actually let's do that we'll just no part uh, hash three will just be important data with no part at all and if I call h1 dot hex uh, hex digest I have a hash here and if I call uh, h2 I have a completely different hash and if I call h3 I have a third unique hash so general purpose hash functions like Blake2b or SHA-256 are not really suitable for su uh, storing like securely storing passwords the general purpose hash functions are fast to compute on modern computers, so it is feasible for an attacker to reverse the hash using brute force, where you just try and try and try millions of possibilities till you get a match. So you want key um, derivation algorithms like PBKDF2HMAC, which are designed to be slow enough to make these kinds of brute force attacks infeasible. So this key algorithm achieves this by using many repeated applications of a general purpose hash function, um, which we can specify as a parameter. And as computers get more and more powerful, it's important to increase the number of iterations you do over time. Otherwise, I think it kind of makes sense, right? The, the likelihood of somebody being able to brute force something would be increased as time passes and as computers become more powerful. So a good password hash function should also use something called salt. Now salt is a random piece of data used to initialize the hash function and it randomizes the output of the algorithm and protects against attacks where hashes are compared to tables of known hashes. So imagine you have like a, a library or an Excel sheet or a text file full of like oh these are common passwords right like password one two three ABC, password one, you know, whatever. And somebody could try those. And what they could do is they could take common hashes like SHA-256 and they could just be like, I'm going to just 
convert password123 with a SHA-256 algorithm and then take that in, uh, that that encrypted that hashed string right and pass that as a password and i could just keep hashing it and getting different um, hashes until i find your your secret password that you hashed so if you use pbk df2 hmac it supports salt uh, via a required salt parameter so this is just like extra bits of characters that are added to your hash to make an even longer hash which makes it harder to to break so if i import os here i can say dk is going to be hash lib dot pbk df2 underscore hmac and this is the hmac part that we were talking about and we'll say we want to use sha256 and we'll pass a byte string of password one two three okay oh, what have i got here uh missing argument salt where is my hash lib dot pbk df2 underscore hmac and i've got sha oh hi how's it going um so i have my password and then you need a salt so in here i will say salt equals os dot u random 16 so that's how many times and then or the size and then i'm going to say iterations iterations and then i'm just going to do like a hundred thousand okay and then if i said dk dot hex and that'll give me that hash string now that is a much longer string than if i had not used hmac or the pbk df2 hmac um, so that would be a pref uh, a more preferred way of doing it and take special notice that i use os.urandom and that provides a 16 byte random salt as recommended by the documentation um, so yeah so go ahead and check this out on your own experiment around with it explore it a little bit um, and sooner or later you'll you'll get the hang of it and uh, we can move on directly to just using the HMAC module, which is what I'll be doing in the next uh, video. But for now, this is just to get you used to Hashlib. So happy hashing.